My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask you for pardon of my sins and grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Mother Immaculate, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my God and Angel, intercede for me. Today's Gospel is full of surprises. It begins normally enough what we might expect. Jesus is preaching and travelling. We see him going around preaching the kingdom of God. There's no surprise there. We learn that the twelve are with him. No surprise in that either. But then from then onwards, it starts to get surprising. We next learn that there are women with him. That wasn't normal in that time. A preacher, a rabbi, wouldn't travel around with women. But these aren't just ordinary women. These are women who have been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Now it's getting really surprising. Women who have had problems in life. We're told about some of them. Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. What does this mean? Surprising, the different fathers of the church had different explanations. Remember that in the Bible, the number seven means fullness. Somehow, Mary Magdalene had had the fullness of the demons inside her, the fullness of the devil. Possibly, it meant that she had all the capital sins. She had been full of evil until God converted her. Then we learn about another woman, Joanna, wife of Chusa, a steward of Herod. And here again, divine spirit, you surprise us in this sacred text. Because Herod was the corrupt king. We read in the gospel of those Herodians who tried to trap Jesus in his words. And so Jesus had a follower amidst that crowd. What would Joanna's husband, Chusa, have thought about her wife, about his wife going around in Jesus' retinue? Would it threaten his position? Would it threaten his career? And then we're told about Susanna. Susanna doesn't appear elsewhere in the Gospels, but it, that the simple name makes us think of the Susanna in the Old Testament, that good, holy, brave, chaste woman who was falsely accused of impurity by those lustful old men. And then it continues, even more surprising, that we are told that there were many other women in Jesus' following, in Jesus' retinue, who ministered to him out of their own means. Jesus, you were partially kept, you were partially supported by these women. And again, this is really surprising. In such a male-dominated society, such dependence on women would have been shocking indeed. And yet, Lord, you wanted to rely on women. We're told later in the Gospel of Matthew that there were many women at the crucifixion of our Lord who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Jesus, you accepted the support of women. Later on, it will be women who will be the first witnesses to the resurrection. And again, that is rather shocking because at that time, the testimony of women wasn't usually respected, wasn't even accepted in law processes. And so, dearest God, Father of all, who love all your children, you teach us here about the role of women in the church. And we see that their role was key from the start. And it's a good lesson for us men that we need to respect ever more the role of women in the church. Christian men should be the first feminists, if that means respecting the essential place, the essential role of women in society and the church. But there's another aspect of this gospel which is also very striking. I've mentioned these women, but if you remember, as I've already said, some of them had real problems. Mary had seven demons cast out of her. We see elsewhere that 
Prostitutes and other women in difficult situations followed our Lord. There's the woman who washed his feet and anointed them with oil. And that caused scandal. This is a sinful woman. She was known to be a sinful woman. And yet our Lord allowed her to touch him so closely. There was Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. That woman who'd had five husbands and the man she was with now wasn't her husband. And here in this gospel passage, women with infirmities in one way or another, a number of them broken people. And yet, aren't those broken people all of us? You and me, my friend, as we talk to Jesus, as we talk to God our Father, as we pray in the Holy Spirit, we also need to recognise our brokenness. We might like our church, our group, our community to be full of the right sort of people. People of our class, people of our level, beautiful people. But that's not the community of Jesus. Jesus' community includes people cured of evil spirits and ailments, complicated, broken people. Lord Jesus, we all confess that we are broken. I am broken, broken in so many ways, weak, unable to live as you want me to live, so often failing. Perhaps there are Mary Magdalene's amongst us. Perhaps somebody here listening is a Mary Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out. My friend, if, it, if those seven demons have gone out of you, if you have been filled with vices, don't worry. You can be a great Mary Magdalene, so full of love, faithful to the cross, a witness to the resurrection. Perhaps there's a Joanna listening today, like that wife of Herod Stewart Chusa. Your husband perhaps is in a difficult situation, or a male version of Joanna. Your wife is in a difficult situation, or your parents, they have a tricky job, and it's difficult for you to follow Christ. How can I follow Christ when my husband is doing this? How can I follow Christ when my wife is doing this? How can I follow Christ when my mum or my dad are doing this. It's difficult. My situation is complicated. And yet Joanna still was able to follow Jesus. Perhaps there's a Susanna listening today. Somebody here who has been wrongly accused, who's suffering through a false accusation, who's made to seem ashamed, even though he or she is totally innocent. Or perhaps there's people in even more complicated situations. Perhaps there's somebody like that woman caught in adultery, publicly shamed. How can I follow Jesus? But you, Lord Jesus, put the accusers to shame yourself. And you said to the woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin again. Perhaps somebody listening today is like that woman who anointed our Lord's feet who, though she had sinned so much, showed so much love. Your love can overcome your sins. We are all broken. Let's just admit that. Let's accept Christ's mercy. One of the things I love doing is going walking or running in nature. And do you know why I like it so much, apart from the contact with the fresh air? One of the things I like about it is that everything is not perfect. Everything is a little bit crooked, gnarled, muddy. It's full of imperfection. Things are bent, twisted. And it's all that weakness, all that deformity in a sense, which makes everything so much more beautiful. Lord, your church, mysteriously, is beautiful also for our weakness. In our weakness, your glory also shines through, through your mercy, your power and your compassion. Yes, the church needs saints, many saints, and we must all struggle for sanctity. But even our sinfulness shows forth your glory through your mercy. So let's not want a church that is only for perfect people, for beautiful people, for intelligent people. Let's also want a church that is for the broken, knowing, as I said earlier, that you, my friend, and I are both broken. We always have the compassion of our mother. She is the merciful mother who takes pity on her weak children. Let's acknowledge that we are weak 
as others are weak, so that Mary will take pity on each of us. I give you thanks, my God, for the good resolutions, affections and inspirations you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you for help to put them into effect. My Mother Immaculate, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.